Today I'm going to tell you which movie Spider-Man is the best. And though in the next video I'm going to tell you my thoughts on the Venom movie, I will give a pretty clear systemic answer on which movie Spider-Man is the best, at least to me. But before we start, I need to make a couple of things clear. Introduction. Am I a Spider-Man fan? Oh wait, I already did this. Six months ago, I did a video on explaining what really counts as a real fan. And it was a lot of fun. One. I love this one. Look this at this. Dope. Look at how much fun I'm having. This is, I think this was probably my first comic I bought too. It's a Maximum Carnage. Is that this one or this, this one? Or this? this was the first three. I think it was this one. There's just so many cool characters on it. I really worship this comic, like it was just so dope. Anyway, am I a Spider-Man fan? That, that right there, that's, that's real joy. In that video, I basically describe how I tend not to think of another as a fan of a superhero just because you watched all the superhero movies. Especially since nowadays, watching all of one superhero's movies is practically mainstream. And I and other real Spider-Man fans at least those of us who were 90s kids, born in the 80s, and I kind of think I have to always say 90s kids born in the 80s now every time because there's actually a real problem of people born in the 90s who therefore are 2000s kids, but living in some kind of generational denial by constantly describing themselves as 90s kids when they're just 90s babies. Obviously not all do that, but enough show up in the thousands and thousands even in groups called 90s kids only and start sharing pictures and making comments about things that are for the 2000s kids community as if completely ignorant of those things are not even from the 90s. And I'm not trying to gatekeep 90s kids stuff as a gatekeeper, but I have never seen another generation do this. I mean, I haven't come across people born in the 70s, but growing up in the 80s, calling themselves 70s kids, they know they're 80s kids. And for actual 90s kids, like me for example, it can be really frustrating for me talking to someone else who claims to be a 90s kid only to find out that they were actually born in 98, are about a dozen years younger than me, referring to things that came out in the 2000s because for them they can't really tell the difference between the 2000s and 90s stuff and can't connect to most anything from the actual 90s. Because of course for most part they didn't even exist and when they did they were just babies. So I bring this up because to be clear that all of these movies came out after the 90s. For those of us who were 90s kids and earlier 80s kids, 70s kids, being a Marvel fan is something one had to go out of their way of the normal to find out more about and learn. It wasn't in the movies for the general public to easily access as it is now. A regular person today could have just watched all of the Captain America movies, but I wouldn't necessarily think that makes them a Captain America fan. Maybe they just like MCU movies in general. Maybe they like Captain America movies, but still wouldn't actually go out of their way to ever buy a comic or novel or look up online many of the other great stories of that hero. So when it comes to my evaluation here, I'm not biased to any particular Spider-Man movie. My conception and appreciation, no, my love of Spider-Man was fully formed far before any of these movies came out through comics, cards, games, cartoon TV shows, and yes, even novels. But to be fair, I admit, I am not a true fan compared to say someone who is willing to devote their entire life to Spider-Man with a great collection or having read every little thing about him. So it's definitely a relative term and please watch that video so you can hear a little bit more about what I mean. 2. I want everyone to be aware of their own potential bias in terms of first loves. I have explained many times before on this show and likely will have to explain it many more times on my show, but as written about partially by Bruce Hood in his self-illusion book, 
we have an evolved psychology to defend what we think of our real or core selves, which actually is just based on our sense of origin. And that really relies on our memories of our younger selves from when we first built our identity. So our origin to Spider-Man builds our identity in terms of our relationship to Spider-Man, which we are going to want to defend almost as if we are defending our own selves. So if your first built association was to Spider-Man as Tobey Maguire, because that's how you learned about Spider-Man, it was your first connection to or your first love of him, you may think that that version of Spider-Man is the penultimate version of Spider-Man. That somehow Toby really captures what Spider-Man ought to be. And that's not quite true. The same goes for if you only had saw the worst of the three Ninja Turtle movies of the originals. If the worst one, the third one, was the one that you had as a kid, you will love it off as if it were the best, even if later in life you become aware of the facts and the general audience says otherwise. For another example, the same goes for if, say, Final Fantasy X was the first Final Fantasy you ever played and loved, you will think it ultimately is the best, or try to portray it in some way as the best, in some category at least. Some people call this nostalgia goggles, and I think that term fits sometimes for what I'm describing, but not always, so that's why I went through this whole description. So be aware of that and try to be more objective while watching this video. Especially if your only true relationship that you have built to a Spider-Man is first through one of these series of movies. And again, that's why I said, I don't have that bias in favor of any of these movies. Each has good and bad points, and to be honest, none of them are exceptionally great to me. And so if you're too protective of your love and identity with one of them in particular, and aren't open-minded to a possible divergent opinion here, then maybe this isn't the best video for you. Because as I said, I don't think any of these movies are really that great in capturing what I think of as Spider-Man. Three, finally, while I don't have a movie bias, I will admit that even though I consumed and built a core connection to Spider-Man through many different medium, visually on screen wise, 90s kids are most influenced by the 1994 Spider-Man cartoon, which was amazing, genius, and beloved beyond words for many of us. I am one of those kids that love this show nearly endlessly. So I'm going to highlight a few things in that cartoon that made it so awesome. It won't be a complete review. I have like four scripts for that now, but it keeps getting too long. But I'll just uh, highlight here a couple or rather a few of those things that will be used in my metric to evaluate which of the movie Spider-Man is best. So here we go. 90s Spider-Man. One of the best things about the 90s Spider-Man cartoon is actually the maturity. Spider-Man was a man, not a boy, not a sidekick. Stories about his origin, whether him in high school or, or doing that whole wrestling thing and the Uncle Ben tragedy, was dealt with in a flashback. The story and visual actually begins with and gave us a man to follow. And I always read, watched, and heard of Spider-Man as a man in every other medium as well. One of the coolest things I remember even being noteworthy for me and my best friend on the playground, you know, less than 10 years old, is how he is in one episode addressed as Professor. Professor Parker. It was so cool that he was a professor and older. And if you ladies in my audience, or non-straight men, need some more visual evidence, of the man in this show. I mean, look at this guy. Damn, this dude's Jack. Like, okay, you freaking beast. Look, look at him outlines. Anyway, this show was pretty mature, and for us straight dudes, uh, as kids, we also got a good amount of visual uh, evidence for theories. Uh, anyway, also in terms of maturity, 
The way they dealt with Venom was far more haunting and terrifying in the cartoon show for kids than anything shown in any of these movies. And how is that so? Well, again, I'll talk about that in the next video. Another thing that Spider-Man in near all his incarnations that I had seen is actually a scientific genius. He developed the web shooters like in the comics as he does in the show and most often defeats his enemy not with powers because all his powers usually are outmatched by the super villains and often they would even outnumber him yet he would always win with his intelligence. Spider-Man won not because he had superpowers, but because of his human powers. He was smart. And the development of those web shooters was one of the greatest signs of that intelligence. 3. Spider-Man was funny. You see, the show actually helped introduce Spider-Man as comedic gold. For those of you who don't know, Spider-Man was kind of the funny witty one in Marvel itself before Deadpool came along with his murky mouth and steals the limelight nowadays for his more obnoxious style of in your face constant nonsensical know it all meta comedy but this show was actually a big reason for why Spider-Man was the kind of de facto funny guy in Marvel prior to it being Deadpool. There was so many hilarious moments and one-liners that I think people nowadays would just assume is like a Deadpool kind of joke. But anyway, it came from Spider-Man. Like in one of the earlier episodes when a spider slayer, a giant mechanical spider, grabbed JJ's arm and JJ is like, hey, what's the big idea to smite? And Spider-Man's like, isn't it obvious? It's looking to mate. And you're the lucky guy. Or when in reaction to Storm from the X-Men, a mutant whose powers allow her to control the weather, saying, powers of lightning strike again, as if speaking to the weather gods to take out some sentinels in the danger room or faux sentinels, giant mechanical machines that hunt mutants, a bewildered Spider-Man says in response to that, uh, power of web shooters, get real sticky. <laughs> it's actually really funny if you knew the show. But now let's move on to the actual comparison part of this video. Now I want to note that I'm doing this part of the video with not even no script like usual but no notes too. So I don't really have notes or a script. This is all on the top of my head. I do have a little sort of graph here to talk about but if I misspeak or some of my facts are a little bit jumbled here just forgive me. I'm gonna just tell you from my heart a basic outline of how these characters compare to each other. Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland. Firstly, out of all three, when it comes to smarts, two of them at least did have the web shooters, Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland. They demonstrated that they were intellectual scientific geniuses, at least in development of that web shooter. So I've got to give them both points for that. Not just that, but when it comes to the comedic element, Definitely both Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland are much more comedic, funny. Tobey Maguire just felt much more like an older version of Spider-Man, where he's just kind of a person dealing with his issues. The Tobey Maguire Spider-Man seemed much more somber, kind of sad at times, and even when it was kind of funny, it felt much more like we were laughing at him than with him. But in Tobey Maguire's favor, I have to say that out of all of these, when it comes to being a man, none of them really felt truly manly to me. But at very least, Tobey Maguire was much closer to the idea of seeing a Spider-Man being a man than the other two. The other two are quite clearly kids. So I think Maguire's Spider-Man does deserve some credence for that fact. But next I want to talk about power. When it comes to power demonstration, I always find that people have no idea how amazingly powerful Spider-Man is. He's not a weak human being with web slinger and wall crawling ability. He's actually very, very wickedly powerful. He's many times, multiple times stronger than Captain America. In fact, if Spider-Man punched Captain America, he could probably crack his skull right now. Anyway, when it comes to his power representation, his superpowers, I think it was kind of shown a little bit in Andrew Garfield when he was able to bend that field goal post just by throwing a football, which is kind of a funny nonsensical comedy thing, but it is best represented in Tom Holland's Spider-Man. 
Because while a lot of people don't seem to really recognize, but Tom Holland's Spider-Man was able to show the power of Spider-Man in not only easily catching the Winter Soldier's metal arm, which is supposed to be like his most powerful super strength thing that he has, is just casually caught by Spider-Man like it's nothing when Captain America or possibly others struggle so much with the fact that he has such a powerful arm. But also the fact that in Civil War, which actually finally introduced Spider-Man back into the MCU, it was both Falcon and the Winter Soldier, both of them combined trying to take on Spider-Man. And Spider-Man easily dealt with both of them. In a way, defeating both of them was no problem for Spider-Man. So even though we're supposed to recognize Falcon as a force that eventually becomes Captain America, both in comics and in the movie, but also united with the force that is the Winter Soldier, Bucky Barnes, who also kind of later becomes Captain America. But anyway, both of them, the both these potential future Captain Americas combined were outmatched by Spider-Man. So I really loved and appreciated the amount of power demonstrated by Tom Holland's Spider-Man in a way that outplays the others. And for that, I give great respect to Tom Holland's Spider-Man. But now I'm going to talk about something that not even the 90s cartoon Spider-Man did well. And this is something I have to recognize recognizing my own bias, which is the power of canon. Sticking close to what canon is, is pretty darn important. Yeah, you don't have to be 100% accurate. Definitely, we should be open to artistic license. But certain things become very, very important to a character and how that character has developed. Spider-Man definitely shouldn't be one that exists without Uncle Ben dying in that tragic lesson for him when he was younger. But a lot of people don't know, and I promise I'll make another video about this, but a huge part of one of the largest events, not equal to, but definitely second only possibly to Uncle Ben's death in Spider-Man's life, is the death of Gwen Stacy. But out of all these movies, and even the 90s cartoon show, only one of them actually dealt with that most tragic event that literally changed how comic books dealt with death. Spider-Man and Spider-Man comics, in a way, made death real. Because an actual loved one, a person that was close to the main superhero, could die in a permanent way. At least until, you know, Superman came and screwed up death for everyone because he could just come back to life. Anyway, death in a way was made by Spider-Man and broken by Superman. But that impact came from the death of Gwen Stacy. So Andrew Garfield's character sticking to how that was sort of done with the death of Gwen Stacy gives it some major points to canon. They definitely do try to make their own versions sort of of it, both in the 90s cartoon and with Tobey Maguire's movie, uh, except with Mary Jane instead of Gwen Stacy, but they don't actually die. In Tobey's case, she ends up being saved, and in the 90s cartoon, she's just kind of teleported to another dimension and we just don't know where she's gone. So maybe somebody would give them half points for that, but there was no death of Gwen Stacy. And for that, that and for that, credit really needs to go heavily to Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. So now I want to mention some unofficial factors that I have going on here as well. Not that anything here is truly official, but anyway, it always seemed to me that Garfield's Spider-Man was generally just fun in a way that the others aren't. But I won't give credit for that because I already kind of did with the funny factor. But I noted then, and I should now, that maybe that factor actually counts more towards the Spider-Man movies rather than the movie Spider-Man, which is what I'm judging here, because it seemed more like that their movies are just funny rather than Spider-Man himself being the source of the comedy, even in extreme near-death situations, which is what made Spider-Man often shockingly comical. But as I stated in that note, I still counted it towards Garfield and Holland because of how it contrasted against the more melancholic Spider-Man of Tobey Maguire. But that being said, it actually helps Tobey in terms of romance. Romance for Spider-Man is actually a very important storyline. His struggles with wanting to have a romantic partner as a young man, Peter Parker, but having to keep his identity secret. 
And I'm glad all of these stories show that romantic storyline for Spider-Man. But Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man had a far more compelling and, dare I say, beautiful romantic storyline. But I suspect I might feel that way because I think of him more as a man and Mary Jane, in his movie, as more of a young woman. And this might be why I find their love more compelling and touching even. But this brings me to another point. The mask thing. You see, keeping his identity by keeping his mask on is actually very important to Spider-Man in the comic book universe in a way that it isn't for most other popular heroes. Spider-Man always keeps his mask on. Hiding his identity is a way of protecting his family and loved ones. He doesn't reveal who he is to his family, nor even his allies. This is what makes his love story often complicated in interesting ways. But I definitely understand that when it comes to movie Spider-Man, they are specifically wanting to be maskless all the time because, hey, actors gotta get paid. Or else they'll just use a stunt double or a CGI model constantly. Still, I felt that two of these movies did a good job portraying that. But in Tom Holland's Spider-Man, it's like his friends just know or his family knows and all his allies because he just keeps taking off his mask constantly in front of everyone. Of course, this is because he, as an actor, wants to be among his team of actors, so he shows his face more in front of them. But the reality is that doesn't really fit with a Spider-Man who knows the importance of keeping your identity secret. So Tom Holland's Spider-Man really kind of disrespects this sort of idea, but in that theme of disrespect, I guess, and not living up to what Spider-Man is, at least to me, which is what this whole video is about, sort of, let's go to my final official factor here. Independence. You see, Spider-Man does not need to be on any team, whether natural teams like the Fantastic Four or the X-Men, or unnatural teams like the Avengers, a team made up of a bunch of independent heroes that were failing independently and had to kind of group together to make a team to become more appealing and therefore more financially successful. These members of the Avengers had to group up to survive in the comic book world in a way that Spider-Man didn't. They had to group up, not him. To understand why I'm emphasizing this important is to understand that Spider-Man is the prize of Marvel. He is their crown jewel. He is their flagman. I once saw a list, a poll done of the top three most recognized superheroes around the world across decades. And it showed Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man. Now, as a Marvel fan, it kind of does cheese me that, you know, DC's on top, but hey, you know what, actually it makes a lot of sense. Superman was there for a lot longer. But it was quite clear that Spider-Man was on top when it comes to Marvel. And though I can't find that study that I had originally seen, there are a lot of other polls suggesting the exact same thing. It is pretty much cross-corroborated by many polls conducted by many independent sources. That's why Spider-Man is always in the front. He's up front. He is the face of Marvel. There's also a wonderful video by Data is Beautiful, a YouTube channel, that I think that if you watch, it will truly convey the sense of the big three. In the data available to that video, it clearly shows that for more than a couple decades, Spider-Man, Batman, and Superman destroy all the competition. And I'm just showing images here, their visualizations are actually much more enjoyable to see. So please go check it out. But a little bit more than across three decades, 30 years, these results show that only two heroes stay top three in a hugely proportionate way compared to all the other heroes those two are Batman and Spider-Man. Excluding DC then, clearly Spider-Man reigns supreme. Now this graph nor the other ranking systems or polls are truly scientific. I don't even know if there's actually a scientific study into which superhero is the most popular, but there is still enough data and information out there, even without me specifically looking for it. Sometimes it just somehow shows up on its own, but it leads me to feel safe in knowing that this isn't just some personal opinion of mine. But anyway, the point is that there's two factors actually here. Independence and Spider-Man's greatness. 
that are interconnected and are kind of being muddled. However, when it comes to independence, then the point of being independent and feeling independent really goes both towards Toby and Andrew. And this is actually a huge gutting to Tom Holland in terms of that connection to greatness. This I try to highlight to help explain how badly the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, has treated Spider-Man. That it no longer reflects the greatness of Spider-Man and in fact has damaged it. Because comic books which kind of truly established canon are influenced by other mediums in good ways that I do like, like in the way that it's influenced by the comedy from the 90s cartoon show, but it's now also being influenced in a bad way. Because now the comics kind of to help bring in moviegoers into the comic buying fandom also have brought Tom Holland's type of Spider-Man. A Spider-Man that is a kind of side character in the MCU. Looking up to Tony Stark. Yeah, Iron Man. That Stark that needed the Avengers. Spider-Man is now being treated as a pseudo subordinate to him. A kind of Robin to the Batman that is Iron Man. Or as if an Iron Man Jr. Discussing if he can even fulfill the mantle of Iron Man. Like what? Even seeking validation and approval from the Avengers or S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, are you kidding me? And maybe the worst of all, for this Spider-Man? Replacing Ben Parker's death with Tony Stark's sacrifice. You removed Uncle Ben's role? In Peter Parker's life? As if Parker wouldn't have already learned the lesson of responsibility and loss, which it seems like they're portraying him as if he still has to grapple with that in the second of his movie, the fourth or even fifth of his appearances so far, and he's still dealing with this idea. It is a slap in the face of those who I would consider real Spider-Man fans. To replace Uncle Ben, to first of all replace Uncle Ben, but also not merely with another good noble hero like say Captain America, Steve Rogers, but Tony Stark of all people? This does have to do with how he was introduced in Civil War specifically, but I can explain that in another video that I might call Why Civil War Ruined Spider-Man. But the point is that this Spider-Man does not reflect or parallel the long history of greatness of Spider-Man in Marvel compared to other heroes in general, let alone compared to this guy. Again, no hate on true comic book fans of Iron Man. But there are facts supporting the understanding of Spider-Man's proportionate greatness for superheroes around the world in general, in comic books and in actual real life, the world itself. What the MCU has done does damage to that sense of greatness, reducing him from a young man who has memories of being a child to actually being a child from one of the great champions to a wannabe hero, from a hero who walks his own path to one desperate for approval from a group of real heroes. Like what the heck is that? It's actually far more reflective of perhaps how Tom Holland as a younger actor feels wanting to be among other actors of Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Evans and the other Avengers, not of what Spider-Man was. Spider-Man in the MCU is now made into a minor character in a Marvel universe that is telling more of a main storyline of the Avengers as a cross point for everyone, but of which there are sort of more optional stories like Ant-Man, and Spider-Man has become an optional add-on to that. While the MCU does seem to recognize that Spider-Man is special even as a subordinate in certain ways, there are certain details, I'm not going to discuss them here, but it still does treat him now as proportionately smaller in greatness to Captain America, Iron Man, and yeah, even Thor. To be honest, these guys feel way more cool than him. How is that even possible? He is the most recognized hero of all. For the most of history, they were very much smaller compared to him. He was the crown prize of Marvel. And now, even in his own movies, the villains don't care for him. They care for Stark or others. 
This crunching of his greatness into this dependent subordinate, and specifically of Stark, in a way that removes Uncle Ben? It's frankly disgusting to me. Hey, I didn't sit through like 50 plus flashbacks of Uncle Ben dying over and over again for the MCU just to come around and be like, nah, that's uh, that's not as important as uh, Tony Stark will be like, a, you know, like a father figure for Spider-Man. Uh, no. Parker's father is dead, his mother is dead, his uncle dead, and his great loved one also dead. Yeah, but but like Tony Stark, he's like Robert Downey Jr. And like we're gonna need him to help boost the Spider-Man movie sales. What? N no, no you don't. Some really won't see how he's actually being crunched down into a minor hero in the MCU. Because of small details like the fact that right from the get-go in the MCU, we build a relationship with this Spider-Man not because of his own movie, but because he plays one small role among many others, other heroes, in a larger movie. This crunching of greatness and awesomeness and coolness is not something I expect movie fans alone to truly get. Though I'm not saying that it's impossible, I just think it would especially be hard for people who are only MCU fans and only watch Tom Holland's Spider-Man to understand why this one feels like a slap in the face. This happens because of movie rights, of course. It's nobody's specific fault. While this Spider-Man is the most hurtful to some of us, not all, who consider ourselves real fans, that's a pain that the general public may not feel at all as a general movie for the general public. To be honest, I was on the side of hoping to get Spider-Man back into the MCU years ago, and I will talk about that, I guess, in that quick video on Civil War. But seeing what they did to him, I am now surprisingly finding myself hoping. Like, I I'm literally shocked that I even realize I feel this way now, but I kind of want Sony to take him back. Because this Spider-Man can never be redeemed. It's already a part of his history. Yeah, I'm shocked at myself. I don't know if I will always feel like this, but I almost feel like now I should be advocating for a reboot, if not a continuation of these, but you know, I know I'm not gonna get a continuation. I also now sort of have a financial theory on why the MCU would keep Spider-Man small. Because unless they get full ownership of him, they could always potentially lose him. They might not be able to re-sign another contract with Sony down the line. So when you think of it that way, there's kind of good reason not to make Spider-Man the crown jewel of the MCU when that crown could always potentially be taken away. Anyway, that's just a personal theory which I haven't really fully thought through. But because of all this, I kind of do feel like now I will never be able to feel as proud of him in the MCU as I was of him. As I said before, I don't really like any of them in that I don't think any fulfills the greatness of what Spider-Man means to me, but one is far more insulting and offensive to that greatness. And because of this, the whole MCU arrangement, making Parker maskless in front of everyone often, introducing a relationship to him in a movie saturated with other superheroes that are independently established, making him feel more like an optional movie in the MCU rather than a standalone independent hero. It leaves me feeling, and I'm gonna repeat this again, I'm sorry if you find this kind of offensive, but it leaves me with a stark loving, dependent, wannabe hero, wannabe Avenger child without an Uncle Ben nor Gwen Stacy, who feels small and doubtful even in his own movies, for years. I may be stuck with him for 10 years, I don't know, unless Sony forces him out. So sure, that also means that he has time to grow, especially if they have now honorably removed the other two big champions of whom he stood in their shadows. Undoubtedly, he will become more a mature man. And maybe they will even do a bridge scene with their MJ, and that could be really cool, I think. I will totally look forward to that much, at least. And great writers can do great things, so maybe they can grow more of what it means to be Spider-Man in cool and great ways, ways that I love him for in the future but they can't change what they have already done in his origin, even if he changes out of it. So yeah, the conclusion, none of these movies I was satisfied with because they actually don't reflect how awesome, cool, funny, and yet very mature Spider-Man really is. 
especially considering he actually has death all around him and yet is still cracking one-liners while he is often on the edge of his own life. But at least these two were independent in a way that this one isn't. And while these two also really don't reflect that greatness in the way that I would like, this one in particular is actually practically insulting to that legacy. His movies may actually be very good and fun and funny and he may be a perfect fit as an actor for that type of character. He may even be like one of the greatest actors of our time. But that character, that Spider-Man, makes me feel all hope is lost to have a movie make the general public feel about Spider-Man what I do. I did talk about a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I wanted Spider-Man to be very super cool. And that crunching down makes this one not that cool. And that melancholy sadness and kind of laughing at him made this one like not that cool. Andrew Garfield's, even though not very cool, was still kind of cool in a way that I kind of felt proud of him. So I'm going to give him another personal unofficial point for that. This all means that among all of them, I actually have a very unpopular opinion. This opinion is not shared by many people. And maybe it is unpopular because I am more than just a movie fan. And the strict movie fans actually now outnumber those of us who still take in Spider-Man from different games, many different cartoons, read actual comics, or look up original stories online, etc. That's become again the minority of real Spider-Man fans. Because and just for the movie goers, there are other biases that would affect them. Namely the serial position effect, which involve biases of primacy and recency. We kind of recall those more easily and become more impactful into our memories and ideas about these things. Also, there is, for primacy, the first one, a bias of declinism. We kind of tend to think the first one is the best and everything after that is always getting worse. And also, there's another bias in favor of the most recent one, a bias of availability, because there are still more Tom Holland movies coming out, information of his awesomeness is just far more available. And that means there's actual cognitive biases against the opinion that I have. But the reality is, it's a shame that Andrew Garfield's will have these cognitive biases against him. Because cognitive biases are actually scientific real world phenomena of our psychology that literally means our psychology is shaped in a way to bias us against Andrew Garfield's in this case. If all movies were to stop now, he would likely forever be underappreciated despite being the one that's taking the dangerous step of being closest to canon and killing off the main love interest, paralleling one of the most important events in comic book history. He was fun and independent. Sure, he wasn't exactly the mature man I want, and it's not like everything was canon in his story, but he wasn't far off. He was still a smart teenager that's seen death, and one that you could feel he's kinda cool. So certainly I think it's tragic that he didn't get a third movie for his potential trilogy. So I want to make my answer very clear now. Forget all these guys. Forget everything I've said for a moment. Just straight up to real Spider-Man fans, you all know what I'm going to say. That without a doubt, the greatest movie Spider-Man is Shinji Toro. Okay, so I hope you liked that ending, that twist ending there. If you did like it, share this video and uh, tell people to watch it all the way through, but don't spoil it for them at all. Uh, keep the surprise for them. Uh, but I gotta admit, uh, that wasn't technically fair of me. I did say modern movie Spider-Man and definitely Spider-Man is not a modern movie. But I did actually hope that my audience would actually already know I was gonna do a twist or trick ending and we're just going to suspect 
something else. Namely, they were going to suspect that I was going to do a twist into the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie as the best movie. But really, I actually purposely kept that movie out of this whole video because it's an animated movie. It's not really live action. And that movie actually, for me, really is supposed to represent Miles Morales. I don't want to make that movie about Peter Parker. But I got to say, I definitely like that movie even more than I like the modern movie live action movies. And there are things about it that I very much love in terms of its representation of Peter Parker, it definitely fits majority of the factors I brought up here. But there are things about that movie that I kind of do find personally disturbing. So if you'd like a video on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, what I love about it, what I found sort of disturbing, um, just subscribe to my channel and I'll cover it soon. And actually, to be real with you for a second, that Spider-Man movie is technically preferable to me than these modern live action movie Spider-Man. Because if anything, it allowed me to suspend my judgment. And even Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse did that to a certain extent successfully, which counts towards it. But I bring that up just to say that I can be hyper judgmental when it comes to Spider-Man. And that doesn't mean you can't be successful. Like I said, I really do like the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse version of that Peter Parker. Even though it's the old grummy scummy version, even that one is totally awesome. But I want to be clear again, this video is not meant to attack or tell other people their opinions are wrong. This is just about how to explain why somebody like me, a 90s kid who loves Spider-Man and consumes Spider-Man from many different media, who thinks about which Spider-Man is the best, not in terms of comparing them just to each other, but contrasting them against an idea of what Spider-Man means to me as developed through my love of Spider-Man prior to any of these movies. So ultimately, if you do actually love Tom Holland and he's your favorite Spider-Man uh, represented in a movie, I'm not trying to change your opinion at all, actually. But I do hope that you were open to mind enough to at least enjoy the kind of discussion that I had here from a 90s kid perspective. If, on the other hand, you actually share some of my opinions, definitely share this video because I really would love it if we could start sharing some of the opinions of what I call real Spider-Man fans to some of these moviegoers. Strict movie Spider-Man fans that are not fans of Spider-Man through anything other than the movies are actually the mass majority now. So they're only going to be influenced about what Spider-Man is from just the movies and compare just the movie Spider-Man against each other. As I explained in my video, that's a big reason why the majority opinion will probably not actually or doesn't necessarily need to reflect how real fans feel at all. But if you'd like to share some of that idea about Spider-Man's legacy and whether or not it is being reflected in the Spider-Man movies nowadays, please share this video to help get that Spider-Man legacy out there. Because definitely in the making of this video, like Spider-Man is really important to me and, and I kind of really had to get in touch with how much I love Spider-Man so much in the making of this video, which was really a lot of work for me to do. And believe me, I love Spider-Man so much. He's so much a part of who I am and so much a part of what I love. I, I just... I just love him so much. Uh, but obviously, I'm not a true fan. I mean, I'm not like a fan enough to get a tattoo of him on my face or anything. Or will I? This is toxic. No. Anyway, also in the process of this video, therefore, I also promise that I'll make a whole bunch of other Spider-Man videos. And uh, after that, I promise definitely go back to my usual content review, some kind of Netflix shows and stuff like that. But I did promise now that I'm going to do possibly a video on the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse video. I did now kind of say that I'm going to do a video on why the Civil War movie ruined Spider-Man. And there are a couple of other videos that I wanted to do, including a Spider-Man romance video, you know, talking about all the different romances Spider-Man has and which one I prefer. And I'd love to do a kind of psychoanalysis explaining why Spider-Man is actually so popular. Finally, the next video, as I promised from the beginning, the next video is going to be about Venom. How a low budget 90s cartoon for children could actually do a much better job explaining Venom in just 20 minutes than this entire movie. Or that other movie, which I'm not sure I should even talk about. Anyway, subscribe for that video and definitely share this video to all the Spider-Man groups so you can actually defend Andrew Garfield to a certain extent, maybe, and sort of get the message of Spider-Man's legacy out there. I wish you peace and victory.